Well, thank you very much for that. I, I think in future I'm going to ask my students to greet me at each lecture like that. I wonder if they'll do it for me. <laughs> um, it's a great honour to be here on this red dot, and also slightly scary, because I've been told if I actually go outside the red dot, the TEDx team will staple gun me. So, um, <laughs> uh, but what, uh, what I want to talk to you about today is, is almost a defining issue for, for sustainability, um, which I think is climate change, global climate change. And uh, in a sense, we've known about this problem. We've certainly known that humans are changing the climate for, 90, uh, for 20 years at least. We've known about the science for more like 90 or 100 years. But the evidence that humans are really changing the climate has been for at least for 20 years. Um, and yet, we haven't been dealing with the main cause of the problem, which is CO2 emissions, uh, mainly from burning fossil fuels. Um, and I'm going to try and argue to you that um, it's time for us to take a slightly more lateral, pragmatic view. We need to get away from uh, sort of historically entrenched positions in terms of climate negotiations and think a bit more in terms of the Earth system. So this is called uh, thinking outside of the low-carbon box because I think actually the idea that the only way we can deal with this by going to a low-carbon economy is stopping us from at least getting started on the problem because that turns out to be really tough. Okay, in order to avoid the possibility of not getting to my conclusions, I'm going to give them to you as we go through. <laughs> this, is, this is based on my experience of uh, overrunning. Um, uh, the first thing is the climate is still changing. So we've already heard today that um, uh, more urgent issues, or ap apparently more urgent issues, come up and sort of act as a priority interrupt on the climate problem. So you don't hear so much about it. And you might get the impression it stopped changing. But the climate doesn't stop changing just because we don't, we don't talk about it anymore. It's still changing. And this is uh, one of three or four global average temperature records I could have shown you. This is actually from the Met Office in the University of East Anglia. Um, and I could have shown you three or five others that would essentially give you the same conclusion. So this shows how the global temperature has changed, uh, from our best estimates, from the mid-19th century. And uh, we had a surface temperature increase of about 0.8 degrees during that time. And we've had the 10 warmest years all since 1997. In fact, the two warmest years are probably 2010 and 1998, and all the other of the 10 warmest years are between those two years. So something's afoot, and we know what it is, and we've known for a while. Um, it's because we've been changing, particularly the atmosphere, with carbon dioxide, but also another a number of other pollutants. And the main topic of my talk is to move away from just focusing on carbon dioxide, important though it is, and think about what we might do with these other pollutants. This is a rather complicated looking plot, but let's, we're going to see it twice, so you'll get a chance. Um, <laughs> This is, this is what's called the radiative forcing chart that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change put, put together at the last report. And what you can see in the red bars here are the warming factors that we've had, the, the influences we've had through pollution on the climate. The red bars on the right-hand side are warming factors, and the blue bars are rather accidental and fortunate um, cooling factors that are associated with pollution. So we'll come back to this, but let's just look at three particular things. The first thing is that the largest forcing is indeed carbon dioxide. At the top, it's about 1.6 watts per meter squared. That's the units we use to measure the imbalance in the climate system, and that leads to the sort of warming we're seeing. I also want to show you the natural forcing from the sun, which is often put forward as an alternative to greenhouse warming, and that's really tiny, as far as we can tell. Nowhere near big enough to account for the warming I just showed you. And then the really dangerous situation we're in at the moment is that the other four things below uh, carbon dioxide there, of which there are many, which we could act on, happen to cancel out just now. And it gives us the impression that the total forcing you see at the bottom here is all due to carbon dioxide. It isn't. It's just that the other factors at the moment, and just at the moment, are cancelling out. And we'll come back to that. Let's put this in context, though. So this is the carbon dioxide as it's varied from the last ice age, which was at its height about 18,000 years ago, shown by the grey box. And carbon dioxide rose naturally from the ice age at about 190 parts a million, and rose by about a half on top of that over 5,000 years. If you look at the right-hand side of that plot, you see this spike that we're currently producing in the system. And that's a similar rise, but over 100 years. And this is almost unprecedented in terms of its rate. In fact, we, don't, we can't see anything in Earth's history that's been this fast. And then I'm going to show you a similar plot for methane. And I'm going to argue shortly that if we control this lower plot, even though it has a lower direct effect on climate, we've got a better chance of controlling the spike in the upper plot. 
Okay, so this recognition that the climate is changing and that greenhouse gases are going up and it's due to human beings motivated the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which has this as its overall goal, and a great goal it is, stabilisation of greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. This introduces the term dangerous, which many people thought was dangerously subjective. In a way, it is. But the one thing that has come out of climate negotiations recently is an agreement on what dangerous means, surprisingly, which is, according at least to the, the Copenhagen negotiations around the UNFCC, it's two degrees of global warming above pre-industrial. We already had 0.8. We've got 0.4 that's still in the system. It's in the pipeline because of lags in the system. So we're, pretty, we're getting pretty close to it already. So what can we do? So the focus to date has naturally been on reducing carbon dioxide. It is that largest forcing factor that I showed you. <coughs> but that isn't working. And we're running out of time to avoid two degrees. Just let me demonstrate this to you. So this is how global carbon dioxide emissions have varied from the mid-19th century. I could have gone back, but it's quite small before the mid-19th century. And you see, particularly after the Second World War, they've increased abruptly. The units here are gigatons of carbon per year. So this is billions of tons of carbon in the form of CO2 per year. And since we've got six billion people, this is more than one. Uh, one uh, tonne of carbon per person per year. This is what, so this is what we, the path we've been on. And up to 2000, when we did this calculation, we tried to work out what we had to do next. And this is what we think you have to do. So about 8 billion tonnes of carbon now. You have to peak from 2000 within about two to three decades and then come down really sharply, okay, such that you get to a 60% cut by 2050. Um, and you have to keep on going down after that. But even at 2050, given that we're going to have more people on the Earth, probably 8.5 billion, this means that we've actually got to get to the average carbon footprint of people in India now, whilst all aspiring, of course, to our lifestyles that are five times larger than that in terms of carbon footprint, or 10 times in the US. It's a tough, tough problem. And we've not been de dealing with it. These are the recent trends from 2000. So Kyoto Protocol, which is the only international um, mechanism we currently have to try and deal with CO2 emissions it was penned in 97 and actually be became legal in 2005 and this is how the emissions have gone up. If you can see the impact of policy on this then you're a better man than I am and certainly, and certainly a better woman. Um, <laughs> um, so if you look at this, it looks actually, if you get to say 2009, you might think, oh great, we've dealt with the problem, but this was just a temporary impact to the economic downturn and the next year was a the highest CO2 emissions on record. So we're not doing it. We're just not dealing with this. So what else could we do? Well, there's a couple of things we could do. One is we could just try to convince ourselves the problem doesn't exist. We could find a nice beach down in Devon. Could have bury a head in the sand. <laughs> this is not very sustainable. It, eventually, the waves of reality just wash you away. I have tried it. It doesn't work. We could focus on adaptation, so we could say we're going, climate change is inevitable, and that's true to a degree. And then we're just focused on adaptation. But to be honest, some of the warmings, climate changes we might have over the next century, in the extreme case, would be difficult to adapt to. So we've got to do something else as well. Or we could pull some of these other levers that influence the climate, these complicated factors that appear to cancel out. Let's go back to our relative forcing plot. I promised you I'd show you again. I'm sure you're really pleased to see it. Um, <laughs> Look at these other factors here. So these cancel out at the moment, but we can do things with these. It doesn't solve the CO2 problem in the long term, but it gives us a start on the problem. And we're going to look particularly at methane, which is CH4 on this plot, just below the CO2. Th this is a part of a more general and even more radical uh, reassessment of what we do with climate change. I'm not going to touch on this much, but there's, there's some climate scientists now thinking about geoengineering, which is cancelling out the impacts of global warming by some other mechanism, like, for example, reflecting the sun with huge space shades or even creating brighter clouds. And this causes a lot of debate, um, which is why I'm not talking about it. <laughs> um, there are probably, uh, there are lots of reasons why people are un uncomfortable with this. Is the idea that two wrongs don't make a right. The fact that you can't actually cancel out global warming by just reflecting sunlight, you change the planet in various ways. And there's things we could do before we got to such a really thinking outside the box. Let's just go slightly outside the box. Although not outside, no. Um. <laughs> 
So let's, let's think about action on other pollutants, especially methane. Now, it's been known for a while that if you reduce methane, then you also reduce tropospheric ozone, which is not the ozone in the stratosphere that we want, but the ozone near the surface, which is really bad news. It's bad for human health, it's bad for crop yields, it's bad for ecosystem health. If we were to reduce methane, we'd reduce the forcing due to methane, we'd reduce the changes due to ozone, we'd get better human health, we'd get better crop yields, and we'd get better sinks for carbon on the land. And that means that reducing methane allows you to increase the budget of carbon dioxide you have to avoid dangerous change. It's a really useful uh, fine control on the system, a useful lever. So this comes from this idea, um, and this is some of our own research, that this, this idea of radiative forcing that I showed you with all the different pollutants on it is not a particularly good assessment way of assessing the different impacts on ecosystems. And that's because different pollutants have different direct effects. It's not just through climate change that these pollutants are affecting ecosystems. This is a comparison of what would happen to the total land, uh, land carbon, the total, total carbon stored in trees and in soils, if we increase the radiative forcing by one watt per meter squared for these four components. So carbon dioxide on the left. Actually, plants like carbon dioxide. They don't like climate change generally, but they do like carbon dioxide. It's what they absorb when they grow. So if they've got nutrients, if you increase carbon dioxide, you get a bit more carbon in the vegetation. Thank goodness for that. It's why the CO2 is not going up faster than it is. These other agents, though, all produce negative changes. Okay, you see methane on the far right. Methane influences ozone, which is a huge blue bar. So how about this? How about if we do a trade? We say we can't deal with the CO2 problem very easily at the moment. Why don't we trade some of this other forcing for the CO2, and then we'll get more carbon stored on the land, which will increase the amount of CO2 budget we've got to try and keep within. And that's the basic idea. So it implies that the allowable carbon dioxide emissions for stabilizing climate at two degrees is extremely sensitive to these other forcings. If you can swap them, you basically imagine actually choosing to cut the methane and make a bit more space for CO2. And the reason it's feasible is because we have a good idea of the human or anthropogenic um, contributions to methane emissions. And here is the percentage breakdowns. So um, first, the first thing to say is human caused methane emissions are much larger than natural emissions. Okay, so we are already dominating the methane cycle. These ones associated with leaks, for example, from the coal, oil and gas industry are avoidable. I'm not sure why they aren't avoided. Landfill leaks, uh, landfill emissions are also largely avoidable. Probably about 90% of these are avoidable. So we might be able to save 40% of, of methane emissions. I just point to the one at the top, which is harder to deal with, but is related to the thorny issue of diet. You know, the ruminants produce 35% of our methane emissions, and they are there in large part because we, we eat meat and dairy. Okay, so we've worked out what this 40% reduction in, in global methane emissions, which is feasible, might do. And it saves about 10 years of global carbon dioxide emissions at current rates. So instead of us saying, we're not going to even start talking about climate change until 2020 when it's too late to turn the ship round. We get 10 more years. It doesn't mean you don't deal with the CO2 problem, but it means you buy yourself a bit of time to get the low carbon economy going. And you get co-benefits. You get co-benefits on human health and crop yields. This is a calculation we did. So what we tried to work out is what the allowable emissions are for another one watt per meter squared of forcing. Now that's, that's a complicated way of saying how much carbon have we got that we can put out in the form of CO2 before we reach two degrees, roughly? And it's about 400, 430 billion tonnes of carbon. And that goes into the atmosphere, increasing the carbon dioxide concentration, and it goes into the ocean, and it goes into the vegetation. Now, if we lower the methane forcing, we get huge leverage on this. Instead of 400, we can get 600, we get a 40% cut because of all these earth system feedbacks I spoke about. On the other hand, if we let methane go up, it goes down to eventually zero. So methane's an incredible controller on the system, and we shouldn't be in a position where we're denying it because of historically entrenched positions. Okay, so just to conclude, um, thinking about these other gases in the context particularly of the system behaviour, the climate system behaviour, allows us to think of other ways we at least get started on the problem and avoids us getting too desperate about not dealing with a CO2 problem. I think it would make the avoidance of dangerous climate change in terms of two degrees much more feasible, and that's a very positive thing. 
It isn't that you, can't, you don't have to reduce CO2. We do, ultimately. We've got ocean acidification problems. We can't just turn down the other gases. But maybe we've got the priorities wrong. Maybe we can, we can get some easy wins of low-hanging fruit. So just maybe we've been barking up the wrong tree as far as climate mitigation is concerned. And with that, I thank you for your attention.